Keon Cannon, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs to talk about growing up Jehovah's Witness in Texas. So how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. Pretty good. And you're looking forward to Christmas. Hmm? Well, yeah, that's the time of the year where uh, I get, get, get my children, you know, a little family that come together. So, yeah, we have a little fun during those couple of weeks. And, of course, it's something you probably didn't have much of uh, as a Jehovah's Witness, hey? Oh, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> so although you weren't exactly born into the JWs, it still goes way back for you, right back to age seven. So before yeah. we talk about how things changed, do you remember much about what your life was like before your mom started studying with the witnesses? Uh, well, yeah, a little bit. The, ma the major difference would probably probably be um, the association of who I could be friends with. Of course, as a child, you just kind of hang around other kids your age in, age in the neighborhood. And um, mm -hmm. I, I, I did notice that that kind of went away when she started studying. I think she, she, I was yeah right around seven uh, when she started studying and around eight uh, when uh, she got baptized and was just full, fully in. So, yeah, things kind of slowly but surely change as far as association mainly. Okay, so you find yourself part of this group. You got baptized, I think you said at 16. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, which basically means you are an official Jehovah's Witness now and you can't easily walk away. So can you talk about day-to-day -day life and how it affected how people outside the group looked at you? You know, really growing up, I always thought, I was I was the weird one. I always thought outside the box anyway, even as a child. So when um, all the doctrines and the rules and everything of the JW started coming into play, I, I, I would have questions, but then of course you kind of taught to not ask too many questions, but when I did, I didn't really get a satisfactory answer. So I just kind of just let it be. I mean, it's not like I can just get out on my own as a teenager. So I was, um, but I did, but overall, you know, I didn't know the back end stuff, but overall they see it's, it was peaceful. People were happy, smiling. The people I did uh, make friends with, everybody was happy, uh, you know, as we're young, you know, as we get older, things change. But as a young young man and a young boy in a congregation, everything seemed okay and peaceful. So the day-to-day uh, -day life, though, I didn't really like the way the week went because it would be Sunday, the meeting, and that would be kind of your only chill day in the afternoon, you know, somewhat if you don't go out in the service. Monday, and well, also on Sunday, I might get together with some other witnesses and we'll play basketball or softball. But Monday, uh, my book study would change throughout the week, but a lot of times it was Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So Monday, go to school, get ready and study for, besides schoolwork, study for Tuesday. <laughs> then Tuesday, go to school, have the meeting. That's that. Wednesday, go to school, study for Thursday. <laughs> Thursday, go to school, have the meeting. <laughs> Friday, oh, it could, it could be anything, but then Saturday, your day's kind of ruined because you have to study for Sunday. So, <laughs> wow, it was, it was it was a lot of that. Uh, like recreation, I would get it in a little bit because I stayed on the same block as a basketball court, so I would just go down there myself and play some ball. But for the most part, especially since I was the only child, uh, for the most part, if my cousins didn't come over from 30, 40 minutes away, Mario Brothers and Sonic the Hedgehog <laughs> were my brothers. <laughs> but I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, it must have been difficult. All that because uh, Jehovah's Witnesses they they spend a lot of time in their kingdom halls, don't they? Yes, yes, yes. And then with the uh, with the children, you know, they want the children to come up in in that way. So uh, I, I actually had a brother that would come over every I forgot to mention every Saturday morning. I mean afternoon around one o'clock, he would come and study with me for about an hour every Saturday. So yeah, gosh. Well, you got disfellowshipped at age 19, uh, but before you go into details about that, can you explain just for anyone who doesn't know what disfellowshipping is, and then can you talk about how it affected your life at that time? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, when you, uh, disfellowshipping is when you're completely, um, you know, to put it in layman terms, you're, you're, you're kicked out of the congregation for what they will consider a serious sin. That could be uh, excessive drug use, but really about 90% of the time is, is, uh, it has to do with sex. You know, you're not supposed to have sex before marriage or, uh, adultery. Of course that's wrong. So when most people would get this fellowship, it would most likely be over something like that. So I got this fellowship at uh, 19. 
like I said, or uh, like you said or, uh, previously, and it, it was for, you know, sexual reasons, of course. So when you're when that happens, you're completely shunned. No one in the congregation can speak to you. They really just act like you're dead. You're the living dead, you know. But when you when you're when you're in that position, you just start thinking like, how what could I have done? But I've seen on TV where you have murderers yeah. and convicts get support from their family, not condoning what they did, but showing support so they won't go crazy while they're in prison. So if you if all you did was uh, what what they consider a serious sin and then you're just pretty much act like you're uh, they just act like you never existed or you don't exist at the time. And even even your parents. And that was the hard part because it was just me and my mother. So when I got this fellowship, you know, she was heavy into it and still still is. So that um, that was real hard at that time. But it was also kind of all. You, you don't I, have to answer this, but I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued to know how how do they find out that you've had sex with someone? Find out? Well, they find out in different ways. You got um, <laughs> some people are just some people have a guilty conscience and just confess themselves because they know it was wrong. Things like that. In that case, uh, this, we're talking about the first time I got this fellowship. In that case, there was um, a group of young people from ages like eighteen to thirty. You know, we all just kind of hung out together and. Um, something happened. I don't know the complete story, but something happened where somebody got upset <laughs> at one of the other people and ended up telling, I think they were the, the child of an elder and ended up telling their, uh, their, their, uh, elder father about some things that were going, that was going on. And it got around to a whole, and, and it affected a whole lot of people, <laughs> me included. So, <laughs> so that's, that's gossiping that and snitching basically. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and that's how that happened. And everybody was caught off guard right that. And it was a lot in that instance. It was a lot of people that uh, got this fellowship. I mean, some got reproved. They seemed to at that time, they were a little bit more lenient on the women. So a lot of the boys got this fellowship. A lot of the girls just got reproved, which means they uh, they just got a slap on the hand. They're still a witness. You know? Why Why would that be? Do you think girls I, got let off? I, I really couldn't answer that question because I've always asked, but no one seems to have that answer It all. You know, with the um, when they when they um, when they get together, the elders, when they get together to meet with you, mm -hmm. it's, it's two or three. In my case, for some reason, it was four. I have no idea why, but it's usually two or three elders. And yeah. uh, I, I, I actually, in my opinion, I think it has to do with who knows who, you know, because they, they might be some kind of blood relation or they just known the person since they were little. Now the congregation I was in at the time, I had just moved there six months ago out of state. So they didn't know me. <laughs> so it did, it, it really didn't take much. So. Gosh. Um, so at age 20, you got married to the girl and the marriage didn't exactly work out. Then right. you got disfellowshipped again. Right. So can you right. talk about what happened there? I was 28 or nine and yeah, you know, like the marriage was in shambles, you know, we had made it that far surprisingly, but, um, the, um, there were, there were things that happened really on both ends. Uh, but when, when I had got this fellowship that time in that meeting, they, for some reason, they really didn't listen to what I had to say about anything. And they blamed me, said I was a hundred percent at fault and anything that happens in the house is the man's fault. Like I can actually control the actions of another person. I mean, you can't, you can't control every action of a four year old kid, you know? So, but everything was my fault and they ended up just really talking down to me. And I had told, uh, when they told me they were going to disfellowship me, I had told my mom that time, which of course I wasn't living with her this time. So I had told her that, you know, I really don't agree with everything they do or a lot of things that they do in the organization. And if they do disfellowship me, I said, don't look for me to come back because my heart, I didn't tell her my heart was never in it, <laughs> but my heart just wasn't in it enough to try to push to come back into something I really didn't care about too much. So you began to see the cracks in the system, basically. So this oh, yeah. led, you, led to your leaving, of course. And, and it also meant leaving your mother behind because thanks to JW rules, She's not allowed to talk to a disfellowship member. So what's it like to 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 live this situation? Very, very difficult because uh because like I said, it was just me and her growing up, you know, single mom. So it took a lot, lot, lot to and, and I mean it still affects me now, but um the only time that we do have any words is if it has something really to do with the family, you know, like my aunts or things like that, or with my children, because 
like I said, they they stay seven hours away, but they stay like not even a mile from her. So she sees them almost every day. So she'll update me on some stuff like that. But as far as conversation, just regular conversation, like what me and you are having, no. So that 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 kind of affects. It doesn't matter how old you are. When if your parent <laughs> doesn't speak to you in a normal sense, that really affects you mentally. So, but I've I've come to come to terms with it, and I just hope slowly but surely that uh you know things have changed. Okay, Keon, you said that uh, you start obviously you start to see cracks in the system. So, did you find yourself thinking about the Jehovah's Witness uh, rules, regulations, the way they saw things, uh, the fact that they didn't. Uh, have any didn't celebrate any holidays or birthdays and what what used to go through your mind as to why this didn't make sense to you as i came in around eight and then even as i grew up as a teenager i will always wonder like why the, um they weren't allowed to have facial hair besides maybe a mustache or what was the real reason for the holidays not being celebrated or birthdays now when, when um with the holidays, wasn't that big of a deal because of the origins of them. That was fine. But simple things that didn't make any sense with like the facial hair and the birthdays. The only example of the birthdays they have is that uh, the only mention of birthdays in the Bible was uh, something happened bad at that party. OK, but that was that party. <laughs> what is that? It doesn't it doesn't say don't celebrate your birthday because, I mean, if you ask me, if you if you make it to 30 35 36 whatever that's a milestone because tomorrow's never promised to anyone so you should yeah. want to celebrate you know that and um another thing that uh, always got me was uh how they were fixated on the fact that if you're not a jehovah's witness when armageddon comes you're going to die i never really understood that because there was even a a, a comment made where a brother was just sitting in the parking lot at the store and he just saw all these people just minding their own business. And he was just thinking how there's going to be a lot of people that's going to die when uh, uh, Armageddon starts. But it, it, I mean, that didn't really make sense because if there was, if, if there are a bunch of people who are just good people, whether they're witnesses or not, they're just good people, never done anything to anybody. Why would God kill them? Cause God's supposed to be a loving, you know, supposed to be loving so i didn't Can really you explain any... exactly if anyone doesn't know what the uh the doctrine of armageddon is where it comes from and why it's such a big deal for jw's perhaps even more than than for christians well that's their version of uh like jesus coming back uh so to speak and he's um you know jehovah's gonna uh, destroy all those that all the wicked ones that inhabit the earth but the jw's take it to the extreme where they kind of determine they kind of put in the members' minds of who's evil and who's not when there's no way you can know, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. yeah, so they, they, they got it to where, um, they, they put it in people's minds to where if you're not part of the true organization, the true religion with their, which there's no proof of that either. <laughs> so if you're not a, Je a Jehovah's witness that you're going to, uh, end up dying. That's one reason why, uh, when you, when you get this fellowship and kicked out, they consider you part of Satan's system, Satan's world, and you're going to end up dying at Armageddon. But like I've, I've seen on, um, several, several, uh, YouTube, uh, videos where every single prophecy that they've come up with was either false or never came true. And, but yet they still got millions of members. So I, I really don't see how, how that's working out, but well, they it, predicted the the end of the world five or six times. I think the last time was nineteen seventy five, and uh, right. all the witnesses got all their stuff together, and then of course nothing happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then they're like, as I was growing up, you know, things have to change because, as they say, I, uh, they always say like millions living now will never die. They said that in the thirties, forties, and fifties, and of course we're now in the twenty, almost at twenty twenty. All those people are dead, so <laughs> they um. <laughs> Yeah, or very, very old. But like as I was growing up, they would tell you that, uh, and I think they still do that now. That uh, you know, the higher education, they don't encourage going to college and things like that. Which the main reason is because you got to take a couple of philosophy classes, and you know that's going to open your mind. But they, they, they don't want you to do the higher education. They want you to dedicate your life to Jehovah. And I knew as a teenager, even though I never said anything, but I knew in the back of my mind that I wouldn't do that because I saw the result of that with people. Which is preach and preach and preach for 40, 50, 60 years. And yeah. they are just, they're kind of just broke. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I need to have something. So, 
Well, is Armageddon something that, because uh, a lot of ex-JWs will tell me uh, it gave them nightmares, and even though they've left, they might have left for 20 years, it still gives them nightmares. Or were you sort of immune to that? Uh, no, I never really had nightmares about uh, Armageddon, even though there were pictures in our books uh, at the time that kind of depicted what it would possibly look like and things like that. I never really let that get in my head too much. I, to be honest with you, growing up, I just kind of went with the flow because, you know, it's not like I had a job or anything as a 12, 13, 14 year old. I just I, I kind of had a strong mind. My mother did uh, always said that to me. You got a strong mind and you think outside the box, which I always did, because if it didn't make yeah. sense to me, I just, you know, just OK. You know, I just say OK and just let other people do their thing. But hey, <laughs> it's good to know you use some critical thinking and now you, you've got yourself out of there. Mm -hmm. um, of course, leaving has its own problems. Like you say, you, you don't speak to your mom. So right. sort of a double edged sword in a way, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And leaving like as you grow up, when, since the association is pretty much restricted to just the witnesses, the only time you talk with uh, people outside the organization is work in school. So, of course, I had some social problems uh, in school, not major, but has had, had some social problems. And even growing up, I mean, there was things well, I got out when I was 28, 29. So I'm 30, 31, really trying to get my life together <laughs> and should uh, doing things that should have been done 10 years prior. But, you know, it's, it's an adjustment for any witness that get out. Keon, it's great that you want to tell your story. So what would you say to anyone anyone who might have happened across this interview and is perhaps still within the JWs or a similar sect and is thinking of leaving, but maybe afraid to? What would you say to them right now? I would tell anyone if they're if they're still in and they have any kind of doubts, you can you can do your own research, especially in this day and age with the Internet. You know, inter Internet's been around for 20 plus years. It's no problem. You can all you can go through. Uh, not just JWs, but any religion. But if you're in the JWs, you can go through and see how the history of them, how, first of all, how they started, how their beliefs came from just a guy who just came up with some stuff to make the, this is a disfellowship, make offense. This is not do your own research. That's my main advice. And if you're trying to get out or if you're thinking about getting out, if you can bide your time and make preparations, especially if you're young, if, because most likely you're going to get kicked out of the house have some money or a place set up or something like that and just kind of go with the flow until you can get out. Now, if you're if you're older, just, you know, and you've got your ducks in a row already, like financially and things like that, just just go. You know, there's going to be people who talk about you. That that was one thing that hindered me that uh, I was worried about what people would say, what people would think about me. But then I realized that those people aren't helping me progress in life. So you just have to let let them go because, yeah. trust me, they let you go <laughs> at the drop of a hat. So let them go. <laughs> Okay, Keon, if um, anyone wants to contact you, if perhaps uh, they've seen this interview and they, they feel like they want to talk to you about their own situation, uh, is it okay for them to contact you? Oh, yeah, sure. Most definitely. Uh, you can uh, leave leave my email in the uh, in the description and I'll uh, I'll be sure to get, get with them as soon as I see it. It'll be most likely within 24 hours because I check that email all the time. So no big deal there. Yeah, I'll be glad to help anybody who's who are just thinking about <laughs> trying to get out. Excellent. That's, that's really great, Keon. Thank you so much. And hopefully what we'll do is on the not too distant future, perhaps we'll catch up with you again and we'll uh, we'll see how you're doing and have a have a part two. All right. Of this interview. That'd be great. OK, Keon, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.